Thank you very much. The, the, uh, what I would like to begin uh, by doing is to, first of all, thank uh, Rector of the University of Southern Denmark for his firm support, which was absolutely essential for the success of this new center, and to thank President Peter Gruss from the Max Planck Society for his unwavering backing, enthusiastic backing the entire uh, process. So it, we, uh, we exist today because of the rector and the president. And they, I would also like to deeply thank the two deans, uh, the dean of medical sciences and the dean of natural sciences, who have also really firmly supported us throughout the whole uh, establishment. And the, also the, the heads of the Institute of Biology, the Institute of Mathematics, and the Institute of Public Health have been a very great help to us in establishing the center. The, the, I currently work at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, where I'm the executive director. And we're, this Max Planck Institute in Rostock and the new uh, Max Planck Odense Center are going to be close partners. Lots of exchange between Germany and Denmark, a lot of use of the ferry. And the, 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 uh, we're going to work together in trying to build the field of biodemography. And f we're going to be helped by an organization called Population Europe, Andreas Edel is the executive secretary of Population Europe, and he's helped a great deal with organizing this meeting and organizing the center. And Population Europe is going to be the vehicle we use to publicize our results, to bring our conclusions to policymakers, journalists, and the public. Population Europe is the consortium of Europe's 20 largest and most important demographic institutions spread out all over Europe. The People who are going to work here, I don't have a chance to, I don't have time to introduce everybody, but these are the people that are going to start in public health. Some of them still have to be named. We hope to be uh, uh, up to 20 people by the end of the year, but a number of people will be in public health. And then these are the people who will be in biology. I don't know if you, if you look at the names, you can see they come from different countries. We have a couple of Mexicans and a Swede and an Englishman, and an American, and another American person from Bulgaria and so on, and the, the uh, Germany. So it's really a very international mix. And the University of Southern Denmark has played a really important role by providing positions for these people, positions with prospects for getting tenure if they're good enough researchers. And then in mathematics, we also have two people. So, the, so we're, we're going to be a mix of biology, public health, and mathematics. The, I thought I would, uh, I wouldn't, decided not to lay out all the research we're going to do, because I just have a few minutes, but I thought I'd just give you a tidbit, one tidbit, and I decided to pick this tidbit. So this is an article that Oscar Burger, who's here, wrote with Annette Baudish and me. And the, the, the picture here shows the mortality of hunter-gatherers. So this is an anthropologist who spent many, many man years studying hunter-gatherers, and they put all this data together to try to see what human mortality might have looked like under the conditions under which we evolved. And uh, first of all, so this is on a log scale, and you can see that even at the younger ages, the mortality of hunter-gatherers is above 1%. It's about 2%. That's a really high risk of death for a 10-year-old or 15-year-old. And uh, it, very, very high uh, at birth. Almost half the people die first year of life. The babies die first year of life. And then it stays low here and then goes up. And, and this dotted line is the lowest level of mortality. Now, so what happens since hunter-gatherers? Well, here's Sweden. And you can see uh, Sweden from 1750 to 2010 in 10-year intervals. And you can see, to begin with, Swedish mortality was not that different from hunter-gatherer mortality. I mean, it was a little bit lower, but not that much different. And then in recent, more recent decades, there's been a dramatic reduction. And you can see at all ages that it's been a reduction. But there's been a particularly dramatic reduction for children. And how much has this reduction been? Well, the uh, one way to look at it is to look at uh, Swedes in the year 1900 compared to hunter-gatherers, and this is Swedes in 1950 compared to hunter-gatherers, and Swedes in 2010 compared to hunter-gatherers, and the number is how high hunter-gatherer mortality was as a multiple of Swedish mortality. So in the year 2010, recently, for children, hunter-gatherer mortality is 200 times the chance of dying for hunter-gatherers was 200 times higher than it is for Swedes today. 200 times. And even at the highest ages, you can see there was a, a big five or ten-fold reduction in mortality from hunter-gatherers to today. And for comparison, we decided to look at chimpanzees. 
and uh, to see how far hunter-gatherers were from chimpanzees, because we evolved from a common ancestor. And you can see that, oops, sorry, the uh, chimpanzees were closer to hunter-gatherers than modern Swedes are to hunter-gatherers. So, so our ancestors were closer to chimps than they were to modern Danes or Swedes. Uh, and that just shows how important environmental change is compared to genetic change. This has been an enormous environmental change. Now, the, the, uh, another way to look at this is to, here's the lowest level of mortality anywhere in the lifespan. So for hunter-gatherers, it was between 10 and uh, 25 years of age. They had a chance of death a little bit above uh, 1%. And the this is the hunter-gatherer average, and this is the range for the various hunter-gatherer groups. And here's chimpanzees, and here we have Sweden, France, and more recently, data for Japan. And so you can see that the, and, and finally this other curve here is acculturated uh, hunter-gatherers. These are hunter-gatherers who live somewhere near civilization, have some access to medical knowledge. And the, you can see that Sweden and France, for a long time, basically did about as well as acculturated hunter-gatherers. And only starting around 1900, there was a little bit of change starting in 1850, as you said, but starting around 1900, there was this really dramatic change. And you can see that today, humans in France, Sweden, and Japan have a much, much, much lower mortality, 100 times, 200 times lower mortality than hunter-gatherers had. This is a really remarkable change. To try to put this in perspective, I, this is in our PNAS paper, but a couple of days ago, I said, well, how else could I put this in perspective? So first I decided to, I should use Danish data instead of Swedish data. Why should I use Swedish data? And, and secondly, to try to understand this difference. So, so here, let me give you some numbers for Denmark. And uh, here's the, and I did it for the last 100 years, 100 year period. So here's the, in 1911, 10% of babies died the first year of life in Denmark. And today, only two out of a thousand die the first year of life. And so the ratio of this to this, if you do them, look at all the significant figures, it's a little more than 30 times. So we've reduced in 100 years, we've reduced infant mortality by a factor of 30. Not by 30%, by 30 times. The, the, uh, here you can see age 10, even in 1911, only two out of a thousand 10 year olds died. But now it's one out of 10,000. And if, if you look at all the significant figures and do the ratio, we've reduced the chance of death at age 10 by 17 times. And then here's 85-year-old people, 17.6% chance of death 100 years ago, 9.1% chance of death today. Okay, only two times. But still, two times, right? And now, suppose instead of looking at ratios, you look at differences. Look at that. So. The, the difference between these two, 10.3 and 0.02, is 9.9%. So the absolute difference is 10% change. And for the 10-year-olds, it's only a 0.18% change because there's so few deaths among 10-year-olds. So the, the ratio is very large, but the difference is quite small. And then the, uh, lastly, for the 85-year-olds, you can see there's a 8.6% change. So the absolute change in the chance of death for 85-year-olds is roughly the same as the chance, the absolute change in the chance of death for babies. And we all know about the vast improvements we made for babies. Sometimes we don't think about the vast improvements we made for 85-year-olds, and it's of comparable magnitude. And if you, in Denmark, there uh, are about 60,000 babies a year, so we can calculate how many lives are being saved among babies because we have the mortality rates of today as opposed to 100 years ago. We can do the same thing for 80-year-old people. And so the, the, it turns out that the chance of death is very high for babies, and it goes practically to zero, as I showed you, for 10-year-olds. So there's very little, all the death for children is among babies. So I compared the number of lives we saved among babies compared to the number of lives we saved among octogenarians. And we, Denmark, over the last 100 years, has saved the lives of 6,000 I mean, let me put it differently. In the year 2011, 6,000 fewer babies died than would have died had they been born in 1911. So we saved 6,000 babies. That's a lot of babies. But the, 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 uh, but we saved, oops, sorry, we saved 
21,000 octogenarians. We save more than three times as many 80-year-olds as we save babies. Now, maybe the octogenarians don't live as long, but still, we've saved a lot of lives. And the, most of the action, in fact, in terms of life-saving, is saving the lives of older people. And that's one of the things that we're going to really focus on in our new center. With that, let me introduce the second of our three leaders, Core Christians. Thank you.